The following program is brought to you by Caltech. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is um, Sri Kulkarni. Sri is the MacArthur Professor of Astronomy and Professor of Planetary Sciences at Caltech. He is also uh, the director of the Caltech Optical Observatories and the director of NASA Exoplanet Science Institute. Uh, Sri uh, was an undergraduate um, at IIT Delhi. He then did his PhD at UC Berkeley. He was a postdoc at Berkeley and Caltech and finally joined Caltech as a faculty member in 1987. His interests are uh, mainly in the study of compact objects, transients and variables, and the search for extrasolar planets through interferometric and adaptive techniques. He has had many, many awards, which I shall not mention, uh, but let me say that he is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, he's a fellow of the Royal Society of London, he's a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, and a honorary fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences. Now, uh, he has had an interest in small satellites that um, began actually more or less at the same time that my own interest began. And in fact, in 2010, uh, he received the KISS grant that allowed him to form a team between Caltech, India, Israel, and Canada. And this team spent 18 months studying uh, ways in which small satellites could help astronomers undertake cutting edge research. And finally, that study led to the project LIMSAT, which is now supported by the Israeli Space Agency, which he will be talking about. Shri, over to you. So uh, first of all, I'm uh, thankful to, uh, to KISS for uh, providing the initial funds that allowed us to um, organize uh, various meetings, uh, some here, some here in Israel, uh, invite foreign participants, and uh, make rapid progress uh, in uh, uh, coming with a concept for small satellites, uh, or a concept for small satellite. Um, and I'll, uh, there are a few um, interesting things I'll say or simply flash along the way, and I'll expect some young person to eventually make the connection or ask me the question. Okay, I always like, uh, look at this nice picture of dinosaur. I, I love dinosaurs. They're, uh, I mean, they look so fantastic, so big, um, and so exotic. <laughs> uh, who doesn't like uh, cathedrals? Uh, they're, they're amazing, you know. You spend a lot of money going to Europe. Uh, it's rarely for the wine or the food. It's mainly to see <laughs> cathedrals. Okay, uh, they're work of art. They take a lot of money, and they have a legacy value. Mainly, you can go and visit them. Here's another cathedral, a mausoleum this time. Uh, it's, uh, it's also very, very interesting, very appealing. It has something very close to where I grew up. It's very different from the previous ones, which emphasize very large structures, symmetry. This is the opposite. Uh, the amount of money spent for this and the Taj Mahal is the same. Uh, to appreciate Taj Mahal, you don't need much IQ. But to appreciate this, you need to be a little bit more smarter, because none of these figurines are the same. Uh, so it takes a tremendous effort to make this uh, about 100 years, many generations. And of course, the most classic building of all, the oldest, uh, looks magnificent. Okay, I just thought it would be useful for you to remember these pictures, okay? Okay, now let's go get going with, uh, with what the topic is. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, why should one consider uh, small satellites? 
I would say there are some positive forces, meaning good things that make you consider small satellites. Uh, there, uh, there's uh, been a lot of miniaturization, uh, not perhaps in the, in the NASA world, but in, in the defense world all across the world. Uh, in particular, drones actually drive a lot of miniaturizations. And by the way, there are far more drones than airplanes these days. So just to know it's a very big market. Um, when you think of satellites, if you look at the old things, ground stations and so on, were expensive. Okay, actually you can now build ground stations very cheaply. We are, thanks to radio astronomers, instead of building large, uh, large uh, single uh, telescope, you can uh, get a bunch of small commercial satellite dishes, the sort you have at home, gang them up together. The bandwidths involved were really trivial. You can practically take your PC and make a phased array. Okay, or very soon there'll be a lot of space internet, okay, just like uh, we have internet uh, today. And then uh, low-cost launches, well, uh, until recently, the emerging countries were clearly the leaders, but they're now commercial providers that are providing and going in the, happening in the US. So you can see that these, these are positive forces that actually make it very attractive to build small satellites, either at low cost or high capability at, at reasonable cost. Okay. Well, what are the motivation, negative trends? Meaning, you know, you will be pushed towards small satellites. Well, in astronomy, flagship missions have grown in cost. Uh, while we have a banking crisis, uh, we all uh, froth uh, and fume at our mouth about JP Morgan and banksters and so on. We also have equivalent banksters and gangsters in, uh, it's a strong word, I don't mean exactly, I don't know the exact word. I, I wish we had a bankster, <laughs> engineerster or whatever things. So we are too big to fail, uh, con and the consequence is that these too big to fail missions, which shall remain unnamed, they may have four letter acronyms, uh, they are straining the system, they're perhaps in fracturing the system. And because they're so expensive, PIs feel in astronomy, even for modest, what used to be modest opportunities, SMECs, supposed to be small explorer, the SMECs are becoming increasingly complex. The one recently launched by my own colleague, Fiona Harrison, here, is a really complex MEX. If you compare the, uh, New Star, and hopefully you'll, there'll be some presentation on New Star, uh, to let's say SWAS, the very first MEX that I was aware of, the, the complexity has increased far, far larger than the monies involved. Okay, well, we could say that's great because you're getting more for the same, you know, the, the return is great, but it also means that the, usually it has meant the opportunities to space has decreased. A consequence of complexity leads to delays, delayed leads to cost overruns, cost overrun leads to future fewer opportunities. Okay, so in general, the negative trend is what I call is more is less, okay. So that's sort of the astronomy thing, where uh, you want to do more, but in the end it turns out to be less. Uh, and uh, uh, so hopefully you're now slowly connecting up with the five pictures I showed you in the beginning. Okay, now let's look at uh, opportunity. Uh, astronomy is a phenomenological subject. Uh, many people don't actually, even astronomers don't understand this. So here's a little joke, you know, that uh, how many, you know, whatever you can put, how many um, NASA people does it take to change a light bulb? Okay, then you could say this or that, and depending with the headquarters or Goddard or JPL, <laughs> okay? But uh, uh, you could say, how many physicists does it take to discover Higgs boson? Any answer for that? Well, the answer is as many there are in the collaboration, okay? So, and, the, and the, the joke here is, it's not so much the, the, the particle physics is driven by a single goal. And therefore, there is a, in, in economic terms, it's an inelastic situation, okay? But astronomy and biology are very different. They're very phenomenological. We don't have a single goal. Our goal is to go and explore the universe. If I could figure out the universe on first principles, we wouldn't do, be doing anyone could figure out. There'd be no astronomy. But that would be fool, that I think would be arrogant and foolish for anyone to make a claim like that. It's like saying I could uh, claim the, uh, I can understand the life distribution of life forms on Earth. Um, <clears throat> so the diversity of phenomena means you really require diverse approaches. So it's not sufficient to simply build a, a LHC and declare victory or to build a JWST and say, yeah, we are done. Uh, even though uh, unimaginative minds tend to think that way. 
So uh, the diversity uh, in, our, in our field allows you to therefore take advantage of diverse approaches. So for example, it is astonishing, if you put a small satellite, just 15 centimeter in size, in a low Earth orbit, you can do some amazing astronomy, really amazing astronomy. Or even more surprising is you can take a 15 centimeter telescope on Earth, and if you knew what you're doing, you could also do amazing astronomy, okay? Um, and that's not true in particle physics. I challenge anyone to take a little uh, kitchen blender or uh, something and come up with some new uh, discovery. It doesn't work that way. So the current, especially the current NASA approach, and this is a particular disease we have in the US, uh, and it goes back to the idea that, that uh, the, the pyramids were built when the empires were at the greatest uh, peak. Uh, peak usually means there's something down below, okay? Uh, so the current NASA approach ignores possibilities at the bottom of the pyramid. And astronomy is a subject where many things happen at the bottom, and once in a while you understand the bottom is very important, then it goes relegated to the top, okay? For example, supernova the type 1A, very much in the news because they led to the discovery of dark energy or the of inference of dark energy. They're obscure supernovae. No one could have predicted that there would be cosmological yardsticks. Okay, so this idea, therefore, I would say, if you are at the top of the pyramid, your more is less, and at the bottom, less is more. Okay, and less is more stands for L-I-M. Okay, so this is the LIM group that was funded uh, in 2010, January, by KISS. Um, and uh, 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 myself, uh, sort of the main dynamo, still Finney, he's a very, very bright guy. Fiona Harrison, she has expertise, so you need all to make a mission like this, you need uh, all sorts of uh, talent. Then uh, we had a long connection with the Weizmann Institute in Israel, uh, Professor Galyam, and now OFEC, who was a postdoc here, both a postdoc here, gone back to Israel. And the reason I was very interested in Israel is that for a long time I've been watching the miniaturization that's taking place, particularly in Israel, which I think is the leader in this. Uh, and then we need a launch, so we uh, collected some friends, uh, uh, hoping for a piggyback launch with the uh, an ISRO PSLV, which is a good workhorse. Uh, friends, as well as we need detectors, and Canada has a space agency. They're not still infected by more is less, so we thought there's an opportunity to, to get something out of that country. Okay, so the goal that I stated uh, to my colleagues uh, was, uh, let's uh, consider a satellite, 50 to 100 kilograms, this is a science payload, uh, and it, the goal is very simple. You don't do a small satellite like that and do everything for everyone. So the, it's understood that it should have high impact even for one particular goal. That's fine uh, because our subject is so rich, you can take anything, and if you go deep in, you'll make discoveries. Okay, um, so we sort of looked into where, uh, you know, not just a single satellite, clusters are fine. And the goal here is some, something different. It's not science driven at all. There is, uh, I, I, I would say, uh, astronomy is so interesting. You give me um, a mission. You, uh, we can even play this game if you want. You know, you come up with this, Shri, I'll have this satellite. Here's a size, here's a, a detector. You know, in about 10 minutes, uh, not just me, any reasonable astronomer can write you a great paper, what it can do, okay? Uh, it is that, it's a really very easy subject. So, that, so the key thing is to be on the sky frequently because things are happening in the sky. You may have all the great ideas. If you're not there, you're not going to discover it. It's a very simple thing, okay? Which means the cost has to be very low. Okay, so uh, what are activities we formed in 2010? And one of the things that I particularly learned a lesson is for 25 years, I spent my life in a mission called Space Interferometry Mission. Uh, we spent your money, $500 million, uh, and uh, we had reached phase B. Uh, and NASA refused to sign off on that, and the mission got zeroed out. And that taught me a lesson. Uh, that is, I'll never ever deal with large missions. So this one, if it doesn't happen in a short time, there are plenty of other things to do in life. So I took it up in a way that was like, it has to happen tomorrow. The whole idea that you can go on for decades, yeah, that's fine, there are many ways to spend life, but I've done that once. Okay, so we had two meetings uh, in 2010, and the next 14 months after the first two meetings, we brainstormed. And the idea was, as I said, and then we, I don't know why we chose 64 kilogram science payload. It just seemed like a nice number. And uh, it was an equal opportunity discussion. We didn't care uh, whether we were doing near IR, radio, X-ray, optical, UV, didn't matter at all. 
uh, because uh, uh, for the thesis are laid out, it is rich, do a thing, build it, fly it, you'll discover, okay? Um, so it's unfortunate the history of small satellites in this sense in the U.S. is exceedingly small. For a very brief period, the U.S. had a Unix program called the University Explorers, chipset, and I know the PI uh, and project scientists. Uh, they came from SSL in Berkeley, and then the Canadians have most sometimes called as the Umbel Space Telescope, HST, for uh, 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 this was a astroseismology mission. Uh, and then there's some sort of, uh, then Icarus, I think, finally has flown. Uh, this has been languishing bright and in Austria. This is a photometry mission, X-ray mission. So we spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, what bedevils these sorts of missions because there, there are certain risks. Okay, and that was very useful. And so this was our, not vision, a plan, if you wish, is to use an Israeli bus because uh, they have demonstrated uh, uh, and uh, uh, a bus which is inexpensive, has flown, uh, can accept the sort of uh, small, si small payloads that we had in mind. Uh, PSLV in India is a very reliable launcher and uh, um, uh, it, they routinely launch uh, piggyback satellites, so somewhere in the five to $10 million range, you can, depending whether it's solo or piggyback, you can actually have a launch. Canadian Instrument and uh, Caltech Data Center because uh, we have a proven leader here at, at Caltech. So that was the plan, okay. Um, so the work began in earnest uh, after, after these two meetings. So uh, we had uh, f uh, collaborators from Canada, uh, India, and, uh, and Israel visit here, I went there. So the first order of business was to really start doing some thinking and uh, so, <laughs> Here's Galyam, here's a Lambda wine. Uh, you know, the brainstorming requires you to think widely and in you know, a rather big picture. So we compared a lot of California wines versus uh, that in Israel and from Jordan. Uh, this was not the main activity, it's the end of the day. Uh, I thought that we should check out of the hookah when let's be equal opportunity about various vices. Okay, well, this all led to a good thing. So the Israeli Space Agency really threw in their way um, enthused by our enthusiasm, so they actually started uh, uh, lending us uh, real expertise. So I thought I'd very quickly go through this bus. Um, and I'm sorry if I appear to be not very, you know, we'll do things in the future. Uh, I feel my life is so limited, it has to be done now, okay? So let's go into the real details and leave futuristic things for the rest of the meeting. Okay, so um, the Israeli bus has been used on Texar and, uh, and, the, uh, and the Venus satellites. And um, you can see that uh, uh, this, in fact, is a bit oversized for us because the payload mass, it can, we want only what, 64 kilograms, but it has all the, the, the precision of pointing um, and as well as the low cost, uh, that was an important uh, consideration for us. So we did like a Team X study, you know, uh, nothing as fancy as uh, what do you do at JPL or someplace. This Team X study meant, you know, hanging around for a few days and actually costing out various components and saying, okay, what can we trade off for, for because cost here is very important. So our initial goal was $30 million excluding launch. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so the usual Team X study, you have to make a trade offs over here. So uh, I won't go into those details. But we actually went into some uh, requirements. What requirements did we have, you know, and how much would it cost? And uh, uh, do we have uh, to build something new? Is there some uh, already a proven design that we can borrow? Okay, so uh, this wasn't an airy-fairy sort of a thing, uh, which uh, we, the, either the space agency or IAI or Elbit were willing to deliver uh, these things at, at a certain price. Uh, attitude determination is very important for astronomy projects. Uh, depends now whether you're doing near infrared, in which case your pointing requirements are large, and if it is ultraviolet, you can read out it's the uh, sky is dark, so you can read out the photons. You can then reconstruct the position of the photon in the sky. Therefore, you can actually make a trade-off. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, so uh, the attitude determination is something, again, we, we, to, we went into what's available either in, in Israel or in, in Europe. Uh, I'll go th through this uh, quickly to show you that the study actually was uh, very realistic. 
uh, with, with costs. And so some of you who may be thinking of a small satellite in this sort of thing, you know, maybe you find this, uh, this slide uh, useful after the talk. Okay. Um, so um, then uh, propulsion systems uh, are something we looked at. And uh, uh, some of the projects we had in mind required. Uh, some uh, did not because some are purely scanning and some are not. But uh, uh, we, these numbers are pretty realistic. Orbit determination, uh, our idea was to simply use a GPS. Uh, we don't need anything particularly fancy here. Uh, the costs are affordable. So communication is something we thought a lot. Uh, initial idea was, well, we'll do a more traditional ground station approach, uh, go by 20-foot uh, antennas. But one of the things I thought would be fun is a, a master's thesis program is uh, why not buy these uh, commercial satellite receiving dishes like you have at home, uh, somewhat not in LA, but some, some far, out, far out places where you really uh, uh, need some signals. And so you can get about this size, you can get you know six of them. And the bandwidths involved are so small, you really can make a phased, uh, phased array very for low cost. It's a good master degree project. But uh, uh, very quickly, and uh, we found there's an alternative to have a satellite internet, and I'll talk a bit about that, which is basically a commercial version of TDRSS. Okay, uh, the usual stuff about uh, onboard storage, <laughs> uh, power systems, and uh, <clears throat> So uh, our, at the end of a few days, our team X study said, yeah, I think we, we can all manage for most of the mission ideas we had. So we're doing basically the engineering trade-offs about the same time uh, or in the same period as a, engineer, as a science things because we didn't know which science we wanted to do. Okay, so uh, at some point we are convinced. We had a, a reasonably practical idea, but we are still debating near infrared at this point, we had decided to go not to pursue radio astronomy um, and uh, optical, but we thought UV and near infrared gave us some more, uh, and X-rays. We decided to drop this for a variety of uh, reasons of impact as measured by us or uniqueness where we thought. So we are now debating between near infrared and, and uh, UV. Uh, but at this point, it was clear that the, the funding from a case, generous as it may be, was nowhere in the league of the sort of money we needed at the next phase. I'm looking at you, Michelle, and Tom Prince, and so on. Okay. Uh, so we needed a go, and this required different things. So here's me. Uh, here's the Minister of Science Technology, Prof. Hershowitz of, of the current cabinet of Israel. So uh, he treated us to a nice uh, kosher dinner. My biggest worry was, would the wine be fine? But turns out... <laughs> Kosher wine is it's okay. It's not uh, it's not some weird thing. Okay, anyway, and uh, um, uh, he said, yeah, he loves this stuff, and uh, he allocated a million dollars right on the spot. Okay, so that launched the entire space agency into activities. Um, of course, all of you know I know read Hebrew, and you know exactly what this is saying. Uh, I know it's a few. Some of you may not. So anyway, we now have a mission concept. It's led by Professor Eli Waxman of the Weizmann Institute of uh, Science. And I really like uh, that the Israelis uh, have a sense of humor and have actually accepted less is more uh, as uh, the official name of this mission. Okay. So the team has now grown. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we now have, a, uh, uh, we've got NASA Ames involved. Uh, the director is per personally interested. He wants to be a co-investigator co at this point. Then we got uh, both the government and industry in, in Israel uh, involved in this uh, project uh, to lead the, the next phase of studies. Okay, so w finally we came up with the idea for what LIMSAT is going to be an ultraviolet satellite. Okay, uh, I, uh, we can have a discussion later. It's not a question of is that the only thing to do. In our opinion, that seemed to fit in very well with what we thought would be high impact. And our goal is, uh, and I'll explain later, what is this ultraviolet satellite? What, what does it do? But let's look at the, high, uh, high, the big picture. Uh, the main purpose of this, uh, of this mission is to understand uh, how stars die. So when uh, uh, massive stars, uh, you know, they undergo nuclear fusion in the center and uh, at some point run out of fuel, and then uh, uh, the star implodes because there's no heat 
being generated to support the gravitational uh, collapse of the star. And it, uh, matter rushes in, and for a certain range of mass, uh, uh, you can actually form a core, a neutron star core, and it's called a neutron star, but there's still a large amount of gravitational energy released. So a neutron star is like mass of the sun, about one and a half times mass of sun, but its radius is only 10 kilometers, okay, instead of roughly 10 to the 11 centimeters, so 10 to the 6 centimeters instead of 10 to the 11. Therefore, gm squared over r, the gravitational binding energy uh, that is released, is enormous. In fact, it's about 10 to the 53 ergs. It's about 100 times more, I think, than the whole uh, sun ever puts out its entire lifetime. Most of it goes off in neutrinos, but a small amount of that energy is coupled to a viscous shock. The shock then uh, blasts the star. And uh, so the shock is internally, here's a star. And then the shock is so strong, these are obviously Yes, using words that some of you may, they're way, you know, they're hypersonic, they're way beyond hypersonic. That compared to the sound speed, these shocks are like 10,000, 20,000 kilometers per second. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of radiation that generate in the post-shock region, which is all trapped by the mass of the star. But when it comes to the surface, the radiation can start leaking out, it's called shock breakout. And uh, so our goal is to actually see stars explode. The very first photons, as the star explodes. Of course, if you had neutrino detectors, you would know that well before the photons reached the surface, but those are in the distant future. Um, so that's a guaranteed sign, okay? And we expect with this mission to find maybe one a month. Okay, that's good enough uh, to keep ourselves quite busy. There are a few other goals which I won't go into right now, uh, but this is the main thing I want you to take. We have a, a guaranteed science which is very uh, leading edge and uh, not easy to do any other way. <clears throat> so let's uh, compare that to Galax. It's uh, another Caltech mission. The PI is from here, Professor Chris Martin. Uh, and Galax is still flying. In fact, I'll tell you a little bit of things we are doing right now with Galax uh, uh, in a joint program between another project I had called Paloma Trends and Factory in Galax. So the goal here is, this is, this is a, a compared to Galax, which had a square degree field of view, very high sensitivity, uh, will be one-tenth the sensitive to Galax, which is fine because our goal is not to redo Galax, but our goal is in fact go shallow and wide, and Galax went, I won't call it narrow, square degrees is not at all narrow, you know, moderate and high sensitivity. And the reason we need to go shallow and wide is we need to go and discover things, uh, which are one a month, uh, is, requires a large field of view, okay? So the part uh, we are now doing with, uh, with Galax, uh, uh, and I'll briefly touch later, is we call it as pre-limb, which means before limb happens, uh, is in fact uh, Galax, as we speak, is uh, scanning a piece of sky that we scan at night the same night, and we will we, be concluded in about 10 days' time. Okay. So uh, there's a lot of work that's going on at this point. Uh, we believe we have a, we have a reasonable uh, uh, optical uh, design. We have plausible detectors. Uh, we have done the, what is sort of the basic science requirement. We are confident that with these sorts of uh, sensitivities we can achieve the, uh, our goal of one a month. Okay. So a uh, few slides. Uh, this one is from uh, Avisha Galyam. Uh, we're explaining a bit more in detail, uh, <clears throat> is uh, uh, why is it so interesting to study uh, why stars die? Uh, it's, there's a larger issue of, you know, it's only when stars die you get all the elements that make up your body. The, the universe consisted when it, was, when it was initially formed at hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium, which I say is great because some of my colleagues here Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, uh, but uh, you know, you don't have hydrogen, helium. Well, you have a little bit of hydrogen, no helium in your body. So how did you come about? It's because you came about because stars died. So you should be very, very thankful to stars dying, to astronomers for explaining your origin. But uh, it turns out this stellar death is not understood very well. Uh, in fact, 10 years ago, we thought we knew more, and now we know less because we've seen more phenomena. So how stars die, maybe up to 20 solar masses, 20 times the mass of sun, I think we probably could say we have a pretty good theoretical understanding confirmed by 
observations. Then it gets murky. And then maybe there are stars as massive as 200, 300 solar masses. So this is actually a very ripe field for uh, investigation. And uh, uh, the main advantage of uh, measuring uh, in the ultraviolet, uh, because when typically for the conditions we are looking at for these sorts of massive stars, the initial signal is in the ultraviolet. It would take a very large telescope on ground if you go to lower frequencies, that is like optical, to do the same sort of work, very, very large. Uh, the sky, there's something very special about the ultraviolet from an optical astronomer's point of view. It's very dark. The ultraviolet sky is amazingly dark because most of uh, the galaxies consist of uh, red stars or yellow stars like the sun, or even more red stars, very, very faint in the ultraviolet. So if you want to, so in fact, you can count photons in the ultraviolet, whereas in the optical sky from ground, you count all sorts of photons from background, from our atmosphere, and even uh, zodiacal dust. So ultraviolet is uh, a really good brand to explore. But unfortunately, um, uh, because of ozone, you have to be outside the Earth's atmosphere to do that. So you can measure radius, and uh, uh, definitely with a shock breakout. And then if you combine these early observations with spectroscopy, which we know if a thing has stars exploded, then we can use the largest telescopes on ground and do some very detailed uh, studies. Okay, so uh, we already had uh, uh, some amazing thing. There was a supernova 2008D, which was actually, amazingly enough, caught by pure luck by a narrow field instrument called SWIFT, I know, which also carries an ultraviolet detector and an X-ray detector. So it saw a very st small star explode. As the signal is mainly in the X-rays. Uh, but uh, uh, we have found a very large group of stars now. You know, most of these signals are supposed to be you know, very smooth here. Now, it's, you may not appreciate, but here, this is what you would have expected for a star. But this initial rise is actually pretty unexpected. And so there's a huge richness that our own data in the optical is already showing. And this signal in the ultraviolet would be 10 to 100 times brighter. Okay. And uh, the reason this is happening is that the simple idea is that, that the stars explode in a vacuum is not right. The stars explode in muck created by, their own, by themselves. Uh, stars, like the sun, loses a lo very small amount of matter, only 10 to the minus 14 solar masses a year through the solar wind. But these other stars can lose something like 10 to the minus 5 solar masses a year. That means in a million years, which is incredibly short time scale by astronomical standards, they can lose the amount of ma equal to mass of sun. So they're, they're not exploding in pristine medium. They're exploding basically in rather uh, rich circumstellar medium. And that gives rise to lots of uh, extended shock breakout. Okay, so um, our goal is, uh, has, as I said, is 10 objects per year, and so we're, do we're doing real-world testing uh, using uh, GALAX, uh, and it's been incredibly successful. So uh, the program began in June. Uh, we, uh, GALAX scans the night sky. We scan it with the Paloma uh, with a wide-field image at Paloma, and just last night, uh, we had a haul of nearly a dozen supernovae. So now because we have optimized, you know, we look where Galax looks or Galax looks where, we look a bit more than where Galax looks, but we optimize it. So we'll have a very large sample of, of supernovae, uh, not all caught early. That would be very, very lucky. We still have, uh, still have another week. Luck is always it's in this business. If you're not there, you'll never be lucky. So we may still be lucky, but we're having some amazing things. So I think this two-month program where uh, we could uh, have this uh, tandem thing, uh, we'll generate about five papers. And uh, um, I think this shows to me this already, it's a harbinger of why small satellites. Now, I won't call the galaxy small satellites, but you know, it's a hand-me-down at this point, and so you could be officially say it's a, it's a small satellite. Um, and uh, it goes to show that you can leverage A versus B and suddenly have something very new. Okay. So how, is, how do we realize this? Well, to realize this, uh, we need to cover 3% uh, of the sky. Okay, so about something like 1,000 square degrees uh, to maybe 1,200 square degrees. That's, uh, that's important to get a one per month. Uh, we need very good communications because we need to know when the thing exploded so we can organize our activities. Remember that if you want to build a small satellite, it is very hard to do all the science within the satellite, in my opinion. Okay, that's what the flagship missions do. 
The flagship missions are complete in that sense, okay? But if you have a small satellite, you must find a way to multiply that signal or whatever you have with something else. Okay, the leverage is important. So for us, the leverage is the entire world. We want to get all the big sat telescopes observing on, 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 which means we not only have to have the signal, but we need to have rapid alert. These are the requirements. Okay. There are a couple of auxiliary signs, uh, which I'll very briefly touch on, just to tell you this is not all about stars dying, there's plenty of other things. And in our business, you start off with goal A, but by the time you finish, you've done something completely different because our imagination tends to be poorer than what nature actually has. So uh, you can see that each one of these is a very different area of investigations. Um, and uh, including something very exotic, uh, like finding uh, different type of relativistic explosions. Okay, so uh, the, very briefly on mission overview. So at this point, our idea here is that uh, we, uh, the SPSAT, uh, the space internet, is very much a part of our calculation. Uh, this is something that NASA Ames uh, has uh, worked with DOD a lot, and uh, that's their main contribution. So we believe that uh, without a very complex ground system, we can actually get key data, the alerts, uh, come to us very, very quickly. Okay, that's uh, uh, because this is a main cost driver. Otherwise, you'd require ground station all over. And, and this sort of a mission, it's not enough to say, oh, we'll get the data when the satellite passes by. We really want it in real time. Uh, orbit, one of the criteria we had for choosing orbit is the mission should be independent of the orbit. Now, that sounds a very strange statement. But if you're poor and you're getting a piggyback ride or something, you can't be choosing an orbit. So, you know, yeah, if it is a low Earth, if it is a, in a, um, a sun synchronous orbit, uh, equatorial, it doesn't matter. We, we assume it's all low Earth because uh, those are the ch ones where you get this uh, free ride, so almost. So that's why we focused only on, 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 on uh, LEO. Okay, so we considered the usual orbits that all of you are familiar with. And uh, if possible, we prefer this. We prefer a sun synchronous orbit, a six o'clock orbit. Okay, one of the things in the UV though, unfortunately, is uh, there's earth shine. So you can only observe, not just during nighttime, but it's a very restricted uh, part of the orbit. So for LEO uh, satellites, uh, um, uh, the fraction of time you can observe is small. And unlike other UV satellites, our field of view is very large. So it's inevitable that uh, with any, uh, anywhere we point, there will be some contamination from Earth shine. It's a part of life. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, and in addition, because we are now relying on space internet, uh, SPSAT, uh, we have to worry about the the location of uh, the constellation of uh, the communication satellites for this. So those are uh, factored into our uh, orbit, uh, our uh, rate calculation. So um, in summary, uh, we believe we actually have a, uh, a mission at this point <coughs> that, uh, um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, orbit uh, and uh, um, communications, so those we can meet. So now let's understand the, uh, the rest of this, the detector and the telescope system. And this has been led by Jeremy Topaz, um, uh, who uh, is now, has been uh, hired as a consultant by Weizmann Institute of Science. Um, so uh, we want about 1,200 square degrees. It's not possible to realize this in a single telescope. Um, and uh, so you can think of uh, both uh, reflecting solutions or reflecting, refracting. Uh, anyway, we came up with basically, uh, as you might expect, with a, with a group of telescopes, each of which can give us a couple of hundred square degrees. <clears throat> uh, for detectors, uh, we went through this a lot traditionally in the UV. Uh, there's a long heritage of uh, um, uh, intensified detectors, they had compl they're rugged, they're proven, uh, but we thought uh, they have very low sensitivity. Um, uh, but we think the CCD is, uh, detectors are now ready. So we're looking into 
two detectors, uh, E2V, it's a commercial provider, and another one is a Delta Dope CCD from uh, JPL, which have a superior uh, quantum uh, uh, efficiencies, but uh, uh, there are issues about having it ready for if you get the money. Anyway, so this is what the mission looks like with all, with uh, where there has been some thought given to stray light, that, or stray light here means earth shine. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of uh, studies Jeremy Topaz has done with regard to baffles. Um, <clears throat> uh, of the, uh, and as I said, there will, in any part of the uh, orbit, we will get some earth shine on the edges. This is uh, something we are slowly uh, getting used to. Um, so uh, I think I'll skip this. So the summary of the design uh, is here. Uh, we have eight telescopes, single CCD per telescope. Uh, this is the nominal size we're looking for. A uh, lot of thought has gone into the filters. Uh, this is uh, primarily in the what you call as a near UV. And uh, <coughs> uh, so at this point, uh, uh, we believe this uh, mission is uh, uh, something we can now propose. So we are now getting ready for mission of opportunity. The call has just come out um, in which uh, um, the US aims, NAS, uh, JPL, IPAC uh, will obviously be responsible for uh, communications, data centers, uh, CCD and electronics, um, and Israel for this uh, for the bus, uh, maybe the telescope structure. Uh, we're still looking, so uh, the government in Israel has promised us easy support at 50% level, and uh, we're hoping uh, to find one more partner, uh, maybe at the quarter level of 15%, and then I, which will, will be great to get a launch. So I'm sort of hoping to buzz off to India and see if we can arrange a launch. And with some luck, I hope we'll be flying in about three years' time. Thanks very much.